This chapter of our AIS textbook talks about confidentiality and privacy controls. Now, when we look at confidentiality and privacy controls, a lot of times they're built upon the idea of cryptography. Now, cryptography is basically a way of exchanging secrets. One of the key ideas behind this process of exchanging secrets is the idea of public key, private key crypto. So you might think of traditional crypto as having this shared key where I and you both share the same key. I lock something, transmit it to you, and you unlock that thing. Well, that works pretty well, except that in most of the modern internet, you never really have a way of sharing this key information. So what we do instead is we have a set of two keys, one key that is private and one key that is public. So if you look at our little sort of Ikea-esque drawing here, we see that we have our two keys. One of them is private, one of them is public. And the idea is that I can use those keys to lock and unlock, but they're not symmetrical. So if I lock it with my key, I cannot unlock it with my key. If I lock it with the public key, I can only unlock it with the private key. This lets us do two things. First, it lets us keep a message safe. So in our example down here, we can see that someone puts a message inside of our safe and locks it up. It's then transmitted to the receiver who uses their key to unlock. So how does that happen? Well, me as the person who's receiving a message, I send you a public key. You use that public key to lock up your message tight, and then the only one that can unlock it is me with the private key. But because the keys are not symmetrical, you cannot use a public key to unlock a safe locked with a public key. We can also do the reverse. The reverse says that I am going to lock a safe with my private key, and then it can be unlocked with the public key. Now, the public key is public. Everyone knows the public key. So what's the advantage here? Well, the advantage is to say that I want to make sure that you know a message is from me. In other words, it's a digital signature. So to make a digital signature happen, I tell everyone, hey, here's the public key that you're going to use. Anything that I send, you should be able to unlock with this public key and get a message out. And that way, as long as a message comes out <coughs> using the public key, you know it's from me. If anyone else tries to send a message as me, the message will not be unlockable and it won't work. So that's the example on the bottom here. A bad guy puts a message in sends it to you, but my public key won't unlock it, and so you just get gibberish out. Okay, so what are the general objectives of this chapter? We're going to talk about controls, about confidentiality, a little bit about privacy principles, and kind of how encryption signals work. So when we look at our information, we think about what information needs to be protected. So we have to pr protect it when it's in transit, in storage with encryption. However, to use information, we have to decrypt it. So you can't protect information that's in use. As soon as it's in use, you have to decrypt it. We want to also use different technologies to control access to information. This could be digital rights management or watermarks uh, and some tokenization we'll talk about later. So there are privacy laws that are important. So if you do business in the Amer European Union, you have the GDPR. The GDPR has some massive fines, and so you really have to pay attention if you want to work in that area. If you work in health areas, you also need to be careful about HIPAA, which has some very precise and uh, penal high penalization rules about tracking people's personal information. And there's a bunch of different principles we have here, things like opt-in, opt-out, or disclosure. Um, but this kind of gets a little more detailed than I want to cover in this class. So encryption. You should know a couple of things about encryption. First off, what makes encryption work well? Well, the longer the key that you have, the stronger the, the result going to be. So you can imagine this like a physical key. If you have a physical key that's got two little notches on it, it's pretty easy to pick. But if you've got one with 10 key, keys or 10 tumblers, then it's going to be a lot trickier. We also have different algorithms for this. So you can think of this like a really simple basic key or like a really complex key. Maybe you have one that like has to have some transparent sections on it or has a key ridge on the top and the bottom. Uh, so you can think of kind of like, you know, how fancy is your door lock is how fancy your algorithm is. 
So we can kind of think of this sort of a different way than our IKEA-esque example from below. Uh, basically, you're going to take a plain text, you're going to put it through the encryption algorithm with the key, and then that basically locks it up. You generate something called ciphertext, and this is sort of the, the encoded version of your message. So someone can look at this and not know how to deal with that. Then you put it through the decryption algorithm with the opposite key, and then you get back the original plain text. So we have these two ideas, symmetric and asymmetric. Symmetric keys use one key to encrypt and decrypt. So in other words, you can use a house key to lock or unlock your car. Versus asymmetric key, there's a public key and a private key. And we use the asymmetric key for almost everything on the internet nowadays to authenticate your websites and also make sure no one can sniff your information. You can kind of think about it from a perspective of being in Starbucks and trying to do some shopping on Amazon.com. You don't want someone else in the coffee shop to be able to fake Amazon.com or maybe the owner of the Starbucks. Uh, they could put a website up and say that it's Amazon.com. Well, how do you prevent that from happening? Well, there's a public key, private key set up so that anyone who downloads something from Amazon's website is going to use their public key to check that information. So because the coffee shop owner doesn't ha have Amazon's private key, they can't pretend to be them. We also want for anything you send to Amazon to be encrypted securely as well. So we're going to again use a pair of public keys and private keys. So we'll use a public key to encrypt our message to Amazon and then Amazon can unlock it with their private key and then no one can see that information. We also have things called virtual private networks. VPNs are another way of encrypting information between multiple parties. Um, they're often used, though, to pretend to be somewhere else. So imagine that you are in China and you want to access a server in the US. You can use a VPN to sort of log in remotely, and then all of your traffic comes from the VPN endpoint. Hashing. A hash is a way of taking a plain text and creating a short code. We use this to authenticate integrity of a document to see where the two copies are identical. And so you can kind of think about it from how do you store a password perspective. So when you store a password for a system, like say you know, Etsy or Instagram, they shouldn't actually store your password. What they should do is they take your password and throw it through a hash, which then basically takes data that makes sense to us, like password one, and turns it into this just random garbage character. And the key is you can't go backwards. You can't go from this hash back to the original. And so what they'll do then is that they, every time you log in, they will rerun your password through that hashing algorithm and see if the outcome is the same. But that way, if they lose their database to somebody, then you, they, don't, can, they can't reverse the process and tell someone what your password actually is. So as an example, you might see something like this. We have a password come in, and you end up with this sort of hash with just sort of, uh, of characters, you know, A through D, and then 0 through 9. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do this. If you want to play with it online, there's a toolkit here where you can plug in different things to see the hash that comes out. So one of the things about hashing is that it yields the same output for each input. So I can take a document, throw it through a hash, and get a certain code on the outside. This is actually really handy if you're trying to compare two different pieces of text together. If someone changes a couple of characters in a text, then theoretically you should get a different result with the hash. Digital signatures work this way too. So we use a hash algorithm to go into the document and to take all of the characters and generate this hash value. We then use a private key to encrypt that hash and so that verifies that it is signed by a specific person. So if you use Adobe Acrobat, you'll probably see this, where it asks you to digitally sign a document. And so you're creating a hash, and you're using your own private key to create a sort of you know, encrypted version that then anyone with your public key can then see that, oh yeah, you signed the document, and the document looked like this. Hashes are also kind of a similar idea to blockchain or Bitcoin. So Bitcoin... I think is largely oversold um, and blockchain as underlying technology is often overhyped, but it's a way to kind of prevent double spending. And it gets more technical than I want to cover in this class, but basically we can use hashes to sort of like verify that all the, the, the prior history of a particular Bitcoin is basically set 
as I, when I create this hash. We can kind of talk about it in more class, but basically we have people that create transactions and they sort of sign each Bitcoin with its prior history so that you can avoid getting a double spending problem. This is also kind of related to the idea of mining, where we get new Bitcoins in circulation. And again, we're making these, these hash processes. Now you might think with all this stuff out there, you know, what are the costs or what are the prices of stolen information? So we can see actually it's not as much as you would expect. So for a couple of dollars, you can find things like your full name, driver's license, passport number, email address. Uh, you even can get access to bank accounts. So it's kind of interesting, a, a bank account with $10,000 balance only costs you $25. Your social security number is maybe only worth about 30 bucks. So you can see it's actually not worth as much as you would think. And part of this is because our anti-fraud techniques have gotten really, really good. And so fraudsters trying to impersonate you are not going to get as much out of it as you would think. All right, we're going to use a couple of examples in class. We'll kind of play with some processes for, for talking about this. Um, but the key idea here is you should understand some of the basic concepts of encryption, decryption, public key, private key, and hashing, and how those kind of work together in order to help these privacy controls work.